Welcome to Law Module 6. My name is Dr. Ron Campbell, and right now we're going to take a look at the early U.S. Supreme Court as it sorts out the power between federal governments and state governments. Back in the early days of our nation, a lot of questions remained as to who was going to be sovereign in the courtroom. Coming up right now is the very famous case of McCulloch versus Maryland. Former Chief Justice of the United States and Chairman of the National Commission on the Bicentennial of the Constitution, the Honorable Warren E. Berger. In this house in Richmond, Virginia, lived my most illustrious predecessor as Chief Justice of the United States. Except when he was presiding over the Supreme Court, which was only for a few months each year in those days, John Marshall lived here with his family from 1790 until his death in 1835. He dined often in this room with lawyers, judges, and other American leaders. And one can imagine the stimulating discussions about America's future that took place here. Those conversations must often have been uh, not of cases pending in the courts, but on the broad concepts of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. At the time of the case we depict in this program, the Constitution had been in existence only about 30 years. Today, too few Americans think of the Constitution as being a vital part of our everyday lives. But in 1818, the Constitution and its impact on people were hotly debated. One example is the idea of a federal banking system. At first thought, such an institution might not seem to be one that would generate men's passions or great constitutional debate. But we shall see otherwise. Here is Mr. E.G. Marshall, who will tell you more about this great case of McCullough against Maryland. In 1791, at the suggestion of Alexander Hamilton, Congress chartered a bank, an agency to assist the federal government in its financial operations. Thomas Jefferson and his followers protested violently. The Constitution, Jefferson pointed out, conveyed upon Congress a number of carefully enumerated powers. The power to charter a corporation, such as a bank, was not among them. The federal bank, therefore, was unconstitutional. To this, Hamilton replied, Congress, under the Constitution, may enact all such laws as are, quote, necessary and proper to carry into execution its enumerated powers. The bank is a necessary and proper means to collect taxes, to further the nation's welfare, to conduct war, and so on. The federal bank, therefore, is constitutional. Hamilton's view had been accepted by the President and by Congress. The bank's charter had been allowed to lapse just before the War of 1812. It was renewed four years later. But in 1818, the bank's existence was once more in serious danger. The case for and against the bank was argued before the Supreme Court of the United States within the framework of a case known as McCulloch versus Maryland. It can be said that the whole nation, by taking sides, participated in it. The origins of McCulloch versus Maryland go back to the last days of April 1818, when a Maryland official by the name of John James paid a visit to the Baltimore branch of the Bank of the United States. Subject of James' visit was the failure of the bank to comply with state law. Any Maryland bank was entitled to freely print notes which could be circulated and used as money. The Bank of the United States was not. The federal bank, said Maryland law, must buy stamped paper from the state on which to print its notes. It must, in other words, pay a state tax on its operations. The Baltimore branch, so far, had failed to do so. Uh, Mr. James, John James, treasurer for the western shore of Maryland. I'm James McCulloch. You're the cashier? Yes, sir. 
At your service, Mr. James. Do you recognize that bank note, Mr. McCulloch? Yes, sir. It is a note issued by this institution, isn't it? Issued by the Bank of the United States in Baltimore, Maryland? That is correct. It bears your signature? Right again. Mr. McCulloch, you are no doubt aware that all notes issued by this institution must be printed on stamped paper, stamped paper bought from the state. Now I ask you, is that note printed on stamped paper? Uh, no, sir. The paper you are required to buy, Mr. McCulloch, lies in my vault, untouched. I've offered you delivery, Mr. McCulloch, how many times? Four or five times? I wouldn't know, Mr. James. I'm here to warn you, Mr. McCulloch. The law provides for a fine, $500 for each and every offense. We'll see that you are made to pay it, unless you will assure us that you will comply and comply at once with the state regulations. Are you threatening to take the Bank of the United States into court? Yes, sir, indeed. It's a very interesting prospect. Suit yourself, Mr. James. Beg pardon? We have no intention of paying the state tax. Not now, not at any time in the future. Now, if under the circumstances you want to take us to court... I'll see you in court, Mr. McCulloch. John James, as he said he was brought suit against James McCulloch and the Bank of the United States. What James demanded was that the federal bank pay the state tax as well as a fine of $2,500 for having issued unauthorized notes. The case was heard on May 8, 1818 in the County Court of Baltimore County. Mr. Martin. Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Martin, Mr. Pinckney's just informed me that his client is willing to admit to the facts in this case. That's reasonable. The bank's been doing business without paying the Maryland tax. <laughs> it's common knowledge. I take it your client is aware of the provisions of the law. He is, Your Honor. Well, then, is there any reason why this court should not find him guilty as charged? Yes, Your Honor, there is. We suggest that the Maryland law is unconstitutional. Unconstitutional? No state under the Constitution may lay a tax on a federal agency. Your Honor. Mr. Martin. Maryland's a sovereign state, Your Honor. The right to raise revenues by laying taxes is founded in her sovereignty and guaranteed by the Constitution. Mr. Pinckney, I'm sure, will recall that under the Constitution, only exports, imports, and tonnage are exempt from state taxation. Does he know of any reason why this exemption should be seen as including a bank? The right to tax without limit or control is essentially a power to destroy. The power to destroy a federal agency clearly isn't granted by the Constitution to any state. If the right to tax, in fact, implies the power to destroy, why do we allow the federal government to tax state banks? And we do allow it, don't we? Surely, if the federal government may tax state banks, the states may tax the federal bank. The Baltimore County Court stained John James. McCulloch appealed, and the case went to the Maryland Court of Appeals. Here the crucial question arose. Had Congress the power to create a bank in the first place? Martin. Your Honors, Mr. Pinckney claims that the right to tax implies the right to destroy. If this be the case, Your Honors, we should resist federal taxation of our state banks with as much determination as the federal government now resists taxation of its banks by the states. As a matter of fact, we've accepted federal taxation of our banks. Now, either both parties have the right to lay this tax or none. 
Not so, Your Honors. Federal government and state governments under the Constitution are not equals. The federal government is supreme. Federal law, Your Honors, supersedes state law. Article 6 of the Constitution. Mr. Martin, I'm sure, will recall it. He does indeed. Federal law is the supreme law of the land, yes. Provided, Your Honors, provided it has been enacted in pursuance of the powers vested in Congress by the Constitution. Now, as it so happens, the Constitution of the United States is silent. Perfectly silent on the matter of chartering banks. Mr. Martin, am I to understand that you consider the Federal Bank unconstitutional? Your Honors, Congress twice chartered a Federal Bank. Each time, the question of its constitutionality was gone over in great detail. Granted. However, the question as to whether or not the bank's constitutional is not for Congress to decide. It's reserved for the Supreme Court of the United States. Throughout 1818, states' rights men across the country rallied to attack the federal bank. Prominent among them were Virginians, men like Spencer Roan, judge on Virginia's Court of Appeals, Thomas Ritchie, publisher of the influential Richmond Inquirer, John Taylor, planter and political philosopher, John Brockenbro, president of the Bank of Virginia, whose mansion in time would become the White House of the Confederacy. The bank's a necessary and proper means to carry into execution the great objectives of our federal government. Well, if a bank's a necessary and proper means of government, what is not? It was not too long ago that we defeated in Congress a bill which would have given the federal government the right to operate the copper mines at Roosevelt, New Jersey. How did they try to justify that? By the doctrine of implied powers. Just as they're trying to justify the bank. Congress, they said, is authorized by the Constitution to provide for our common defense. Well, ships are necessary for our defense. A copper is necessary to build ships. A mine is necessary to provide the copper. A company is necessary to operate the mine. Therefore, Congress is authorized by the Constitution to operate the Roosevelt Copper Mines. Yes, sir. Gentlemen, the Federal Bank must be destroyed. Now let the doctrine of implied powers remain unchecked. And we'll never again be able to place limits on our federal government. In September of 1818, McCulloch versus Maryland was docketed in the Supreme Court of the United States. It then consisted of seven men. Chief Justice Marshall and Associate Justices Washington, Johnson, Todd, Livingston, Story, and Duval. Power, Mr. Marshall, to a public official, whether he holds his office by the will of the people or the grace of God, power is what money's to a banker, not a means but an end, something of which he can never possess enough. That's the difficulty we're facing. The fact that our government is an elected one, in and of itself, is no guarantee, no guarantee at all against the use of power. In your opinion, Mr. Deville, what is... The Constitution, strictly interpreted. A grant to the federal government of powers not expressly vested in it by the Constitution, in my opinion, is dangerous in the extreme. The Constitution, Mr. Duvall, allows the federal government to enact all such laws as are necessary to carry into execution all powers that are expressly granted. What does that mean? The term necessary... Strictly interpreted, it's virtually meaningless. The term necessary, in my opinion, 
means indispensable. Not just convenient, not just useful, but indispensable. Congress under the Constitution may enact laws without which the expressly granted powers could not be carried into execution. A federal bank is useful. It is convenient. But is it indispensable? It's not. Mr. Duval, the need for a federal bank was proven twice. Not once, but twice. During our war for independence, and again during the war which we've now just barely brought to a successful end. Twice we almost perished for lack of a government having sufficient authority to ensure our survival. The salient fact, Mr. Marshall, is that twice we survived without a federal bank. Mr. Duval, the word and the purse, all external relations, and a not inconsiderable portion of the industry of the nation are entrusted to Congress. Now it seems to me that a government entrusted with such vast powers can also be entrusted with ample means to discharge its tasks. Why cling to an interpretation of the Constitution which makes government operations difficult, even hazardous, and expensive? Expensive not only in terms of money, but also of lives. The Chief Justice has it. When the American people decided to form a union, and to establish a federal government. They meant for it to ensure their welfare. You don't think, do you, that the framers of the Constitution, after granting vast powers for the public good, intended to impede their exercise by withholding a choice of means? You say ample means, Mr. Marshall. How ample? Let's answer it by saying that as long as the end is legitimate and within the scope of the Constitution, then the means, if they too conform to the spirit and letter of the Constitution, are legitimate as well. That's rather too generous to suit me. To be anything Frankly. but generous, Mr. Duval, is to rob the federal government of its ability to deal effectively with the nation's needs as they arise today and a hundred years from now, when the world may not look quite as we see it. It's been said that the Constitution does not contain the word bank, and that therefore a federal bank is unconstitutional. Could anything be more absurd? Congress, under the Constitution, may provide for and support a navy. Would it make any sense to say, just because the word steamboat is not contained in the Constitution, that therefore the use of steamboats by the nation's navy is unconstitutional? Your Honors, the statute book of the United States is filled with powers derived by implication. Congress has the power to establish a postal service. Would anyone here question that it entails of necessity the power to establish post offices and post roads, and even the power to punish the offense of robbing the mails? Lighthouses, beacons, boys, and public piers are all established under the general power to regulate commerce. Their usefulness and their propriety, have they ever been challenged? The power to lay and collect taxes will not execute itself. Congress must devise in all detail all the means of collection. A federal bank is such a means. What justification, I ask you, is there in saying that it is any less useful and any less proper than lighthouses, beacons, post roads, and post offices? The bank is, and I quote, a convenient, a useful, and an essential instrument in the prosecution of the government's fiscal operations. It's therefore constitutional. And the Maryland tax law? Unconstitutional. What's the argument? Article 6 of the Constitution. If the Maryland law were valid, I quote, then the declaration that the Constitution and the laws made in pursuance thereof
shall be the supreme law of the land would be meaningless. The United States Bank, everything. State sovereignty, nothing. Power of the federal government will now keep growing and growing until the Supreme Court must be stopped. How? By an appeal to the people. Let this majestic and irresistible power be invoked. See, I'm willing to place my rights and liberties in the hands of the state of Virginia. It's a government of men who are my neighbors. Men who know me and mine as I know them and theirs. Men in whose election I participated. The federal government with which they're trying to saddle us is composed of men most of whom I've never even heard of. Men over whom I have no control whatever. Men who are completely ignorant and perhaps even indifferent to my most vital interests. What are you writing? A reply. To what? We cannot too earnestly press on our readers the following exposition of the alarming errors of the Supreme Court of the United States. We are awfully impressed with the conviction that the welfare of the Union has received a dangerous wound. Reaching so close to the vitals is seemingly to draw the heart's blood of liberty and safety. That's comparatively kind. The Philadelphia Advertiser accuses us of impure power and exorbitant ambition. This is the Richmond Enquirer. The article's by Hampton. Spencer Rowan. State rights, he tells us, are the bulwark of freedom and independence. State rights. The man doesn't know the history of his own country. We won our freedom and independence, not because of our system of government, but in spite of it. It was the insistence on state rights that drove us to the brink of disaster. And had not the will to fight and die for liberty united the American army, we would have perished. I know it. But consider, my friend. Your faith in the Union. To what do you owe it? Impassionate sermons? Logical reasoning? You owe to necessity. Necessity taught you the value of unanimity. Unity. Common purpose. Mutual support. Valley Forge. Princeton. Monmouth. There's where you learned. Paying for the knowledge you now possess with suffering, anguish, agony of body and soul. Where are the men then that oppose you now? Thomas Jefferson in his library. Spencer Rohn on a school bench. Patrick Henry, George Mason, Samuel Adams. Not one of them bore arms. United we stand, divided we fall. 